Welcome to the I Will Teach You a Language podcast, weekly doses of language learning tips and motivation to help you become fluent in any language. With me, Ollie Richards. Hello. Bonjour. Hello. Hola. Good morning, everybody, and welcome to the I Will Teach You a Language podcast. Thank you so much for listening. If you're just finding the podcast uh, for the first time, then welcome. This is a place where we talk all about language learning. I share my experiences and tips and advice from having learned many languages myself so that you can learn that little bit faster and hopefully become fluent in the language that you're learning or languages that you're learning even sooner than you might otherwise be able to. Now, today we've got something very, very special. If you have spent any amount of time or even gone to any language bookshops around the world, you will have seen courses by a certain Michel Thomas. Now, he's well known now as the person, the, well, the creator of these courses. But in fact, his past and his story before he became famous for producing these language courses is even more incredible. And many people I've discovered are not necessarily aware of Michel Thomas, the man and his past. But one of the things he was most known for, in fact, was his extraordinary secrecy and reluctance to discuss his method. He had world-famous clients of the likes of uh, Woody Allen, Emma Thompson. They would come to his language studio in Los Angeles and he would teach them French over the course of a weekend and charge them huge amounts of money to do so. He had a method that, were, that, was, that was extremely effective and had many, many students to testify to that. But because of this extraordinary secrecy around his method, nobody knew exactly how he did it, which is what makes today's interview so special. I'm speaking to Sue Hart, who was the commissioning editor at Teach Yourself Languages back in the late 90s. And what she did was persuade Michelle Thomas to actually create his language courses for the public for the very first time. People have been trying for years. Some of the top language scholars in the world have been trying for years to get Michelle Thomas to talk about this unsuccessfully. But Sue was successful. She managed to persuade him to record these courses. And that is why we have today in the world all of these wonderful and I think it's fair to say well-loved courses from Michelle so that we can use his method to learn lots of different languages uh, ourselves. I'm going to stop there. I don't want to spoil any of the wonderful stories that that Sue talks uh, about in this conversation. We cover many things from how she persuaded Michelle Thomas to actually come on board and record these courses, um, some stories about the man himself and the incredible two-year process that it took to actually persuade him and sign the contract and begin recording. We're going to talk about how the sessions themselves were recorded and the advert that was put out in the Daily Ter Telegraph looking for students to volunteer to come and be taught by Michelle. Imagine that happening. So this conversation takes place in the Teach Yourself offices in central London. Uh, we are in a very nice little room where we're recording the conversation. There are, it, it is a busy office and so there are people walking, walking around. The sound quality is not always ideal, but I'm sure you won't mind in the slightest because it's such a wonderful conversation. So without any further ado, I present my conversation with Sue Hart. Well, thank you very much for coming on the show. It's a great pleasure to, to be here and talking to you. It's a pleasure to be here. Um, there's, there's so many different areas um, that I'd like to discuss with you, but maybe we can just start off by talking about you and how you first became aware of, mm. of, um, of Michel Thomas and, and his work. It all started with finding a video with an accompanying memo in a filing cabinet. Um, I had recently been appointed commissioning editor for Teach Yourself Languages and I had a new office and I was going through the filing cabinet, masses of files as you can imagine with 50 odd languages on the list and I came across a file that just said Michelle Thomas and inside was a video and a memo and the memo was from a colleague in another part of the company and they had sent the video down saying we thought we might be working with this man doing his biography, but I don't think we are. But he's a languages guru. Guru, you might be interested in, in him yourself. So I took the video home 
and it was the BBC Horizon programme, The Language Master. And so this I, was late 90s? Yes, would have been. And um, I watched it and was absolutely bowled over by it, really, especially the section which showed Michelle teaching. So I went back into the company, into um, my store director, very enthused, and she said, OK, see what you can do. So for, for those for those listening who aren't familiar with this, this is a short BBC documentary. They, they actually go into a classroom and they film him teaching yes. a group of students. And the, the interesting thing about that was that, according to the, the documentary, that was the first time that his teaching had ever been seen in public. Indeed. Which is which we'll, we'll explore later. Um, mm-hmm. So had you heard of Michelle Thomas before that? Were you aware of him? I'd before? never heard of him. I'd never heard of him. And I had no idea uh, how big he was, really, what a character he was, um, until I actually met him. Right. Well, so I, re- I took the video home, came back, very excited, and I wrote, I wrote to him. Um, to his New York offices, just a short letter. I sent a copy of the Teach Yourself catalogue because I thought he would be suitably impressed with the number of books that we published and that we were a serious languages publisher. And um, a week later, I had a phone call from him. Oh, I can imagine I was quite surprised just to be sitting at my desk and just, oh, it's Michelle Thomas here. And we had a, a shortish conversation and then we agreed that the next time he was in London, we would meet. And so that's how it all began. So he called you himself? Yes. Yes. Okay. Now this is this is very interesting. And I think this is I'd like to explore this because it's it's somewhat at odds with what with the stories that are told about him and his and his and his teaching because he's mm. famously very secretive about yes, his work. Indeed. I'd like I'd like to ask you why you felt that he thought it was the right time to actually reach out and speak mm-hmm. to you because I imagine he must have had many approaches before. Mm-hmm. But before we get to that, though, let, let's just backtrack and, and talk about the the nature of his of him and his teaching. Yes. Because he famously, uh, he had a language institute in, in Los Angeles, I believe. Yes. And he would teach there himself and he developed tapes himself, actually, but he wouldn't let them those tapes leave the building. No. Talk to us about... Um, your understanding of, of, that, of that? He was very, very, um, not secretive, but suspicious and worried that somebody was going to copy his method. So he didn't allow his tapes out of the building. Either he taught students face to face himself uh, at great expense. I think his courses were something like $18,000 for three days. But he also developed um, courses which were cassette recordings of him teaching a student. And those were used in, on his, in his premises. Um, and they were used by students who couldn't afford or didn't want to have a one-to-one with him. They would come in and they would listen to the tapes. But at the end of the day, they were locked away in a cupboard. And even when we were quite advanced in um, negotiations with him, I was not allowed to have them. I couldn't share them with my publishing committee uh, because he was just totally protective of them. So this was this was while I guess winding the clock forward. Now, when you were actually developing out the courses, mm. still you were not allowed to to, no, to have access to those no. tapes. Okay. And I never had anything in writing. Looking back, you said you were surprised that he phoned, but he wouldn't have written. We had no letters from him ever. Um, and again, I think this is his wartime experiences, perhaps. Don't put anything in writing. Don't commit yourself to anything until you absolutely have to. In his language institute, did he have teachers that he trained up himself or did he do all of the face-to-face teaching himself? He, yeah. he either did face-to-face or they did his courses. And then he had teachers that he brought in, that he would give them a short training to, but they were, they were usually teachers who were teaching locally who came in and did some vocabulary practice or but he taught the core lessons either personally or through his tapes through the tapes okay so he did them um, obviously create the tapes because he wanted mm. to reach a, a wider audience mm. than 
he could if he was just doing those one to one classes. I mean, do you think he had? Did he have ambitions? What were the nature of his ambitions in terms of reaching? Well, he people? really wanted to change the way languages were taught. He was convinced that his method was the only method that worked. He was dismissive of any other method, and he wanted he wanted his languages to be taught, but he didn't want to release control of them. It was a strange dichotomy, really. Yeah, I was, was going to say it's a funny way of going about it, mm. changing the world of, of language teaching. He had many approaches throughout his career, and he did lots of pilots, all very successful. But I think when it came to dealing with the the powers that be in large institutes, he got very angry, very irritated when they questioned his method, when they wanted to fit his method into their timetable. He had clear a clear idea of how his method should work, and I think he felt actually that he was the only one who could deliver it. So you think that's at, that was at the root of his of his insecurities with that is the fact that it, the method could he he didn't trust that that method could be interpreted and taken off and adapted in, in he said ways. that it could he said that anybody mm. could use his method maybe it was his met the method itself that he didn't want to share right there's a story about him um, being invited to ucla to mm. speak to the language department there mm. about his um about the about his his method, mm. and he famously refused to actually talk about the method. He would give a demonstration, yes, but he wouldn't talk about the methodology. No. That's right. And it's um, again, it's kind of it's very difficult to know what to what to mm. make of that. He was a very complex character. So, what changed then, from in, in your mind, from the Michel Thomas of that period mm -hmm. to the Michel Thomas of you have to tell us what year this is when you had when that phone call arrived. Yes, uh, I think I think he was finally beginning to accept the fact that he was mortal. Um, we, what year are we talking? Is this early two thousands? Yes, before then. Okay, before late nineties. Yeah, late late nineties. Um, because we had it took two years actually to negotiate with him to bring him to the point when he signed a contract with us and we were able to start recording. Now, I think he was aware of his mortality. I think he, there was a great deal of excitement after the BBC programme, The Language Master. And I think that had all died down. And I think he was possibly, I don't know, feeling a bit flat and realising that he was getting on. He was in his mid-80s yeah. <laughs> and that it could all die with him. I mean, potentially also, do you think he, he had a taste of what could what, what this attention, media attention, could bring? I mean, the, the positive side mm, of that. I think he did. Yes, I, and he did certainly like his celebrity status. He did, did enjoy... He? Oh, he did. Yes, he did. He would occasionally name drop and he had got a very good list of names that he could drop from. Yeah, um, we've all been guilty of that. Yeah. <laughs> well, no, so he did enjoy that. And I think I think I, I came along at the right time. I think the timing was right. I think um, I'd worked with Teach Yourself Languages and Teach Yourself General um, books for many years, and I'd dealt with a very wide range of authors, and I sensed immediately that, he was going to need very careful handling. Mm. And I think the fact that I was older, the fact that I was a woman, he liked women, definitely. And we hit it off, I suppose. One of the um, the questions I, I, I did mention to, to people that I would I'd be talking mm. to you about this, and one of the, uh, the most common question <laughs> that came back is, how did she persuade Michelle to actually record and create these language courses? Mm. I'm sensing that it wasn't necessarily a case of persuasion. It sounded like he was already almost I've, sold on the idea. Yes. He was open to the idea. Mm. I don't think he was sold on the idea. And from the word go, I realised that negotiations would be tough and need to be of a pretty high level. So I involved the, the MD and other senior members of staff. And between us, we, I suppose, allayed the fears that, 
he had. And after about two years, he began to trust us. So talk us through those two years then. Was it um, was it dinners at the Ritz? Was it <laughs> transatlantic flights? Or was, uh, what was the process? He came over to the UK two or three times a year, I would think. Always travelled first class, always stayed in very good hotels. And he came in. He, I can remember one particular meeting when we were present, not quite presenting it, but talking to the other directors about the Michelle Thomas um, programme and the potential we thought it might have. And it was very difficult because he had these rather uninspiring tapes that he played and they were very old and he was a very old man and we had nothing written down. We had no course outlines. So really it was a great leap of faith, I think, on our part. We had no idea how they would sell, how they would go down, even if we'd record them, because he could have just backed out at any time. Right, so did you did you meet with him often? Was it, uh... um, maybe two or three times, maybe half a dozen times a year for a couple of years. We had phone, phone conversations. When he came over, we would I and my MD would take him out for dinner or I'd go and have dinner with him at his hotel. Uh, so what were the nature of the... I mean, what took two years, I guess is what I'm asking. <laughs> well, he didn't respond to letters. He didn't write letters. Um, it was all face-to-face. And I think that really took time. And he wouldn't be rushed we knew it was going to take time, although he was in his mid to late 80s and we felt that we didn't know how much time there was, he would not be rushed. Right, so it's, I mean, it does, it, you're painting a wonderful picture of how this, <laughs> of how, how how people, I guess, have to take these things on, on faith and have a feeling that something great can be created. Yes. And to have the, um, I mean, it's a testament to to you and, 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 the, and the publishing house that you, that you did see that through and you did you did see the the potential from that you know the the, the second most um popular question that came back <laughs> was were you prepared for the success that the courses had did you expect the degree of success that they had we saw the potential we knew there was huge potential and we knew that the market was eager for them because we knew that there was a a huge number of people had seen the language master and really wanted more. I think he said he had something like 10,000 letters after that program, or letters or contacts um, after that program went out. So we knew there was potential there. Um, It's interesting that all that, all this activity has been in the UK rather than in the the US. Well, I think he had his New York office and I think a lot of the interest was directed to his New York office. And I don't know how much he responded to. He had one. He had one office manager there, so he didn't have a huge staff of people to deal with all these inquiries. So I suspect a lot of them just went unanswered. Do you think there's um, a little bit of a tangent? But do, do you do you think either now or at that time there was a greater interest in language learning in the UK than in the US? I think there is. Yes. Yes. Well, we've got the facility to travel, haven't we? Far more. Than sure. The Americans. Yeah. So you eventually did the deal. You agreed to produce the mm-hmm. the courses. Mm-hmm. What happened next? Well, we had to recruit the students. Uh, we decided that we needed a man and a woman, and we needed an American voice and, and a British voice. So those were the bare bones of what we knew we needed. We didn't know how long the courses were going to last because we had no outline, we had no <laughs> material. No about the methodology. We had no, <laughs> no idea. It was really sailing into the unknown. But we had a very good studio manager who'd done all the recordings for the Teach Yourself Languages, so we worked in very closely with him. Um, and there was a lot of publicity... I think it must still have been on the back of the language master, but we ran, or the Daily Telegraph ran an article about Michelle Thomas, and we just put a byline saying, anyone interested in taking part in the recordings, please contact the, (laughs) please contact the publishers, and we were inundated. Yeah, so we knew that there was demand there. But we were still unable to gauge how well they would sell. We knew there was demand, um, 
and there was a buzz going around really by the time they were published but we didn't know how well they would sell and I don't think that they would have sold in the numbers they did if it hadn't been for the fact that the methodology worked. I think that's what it came back to. I think people were very attracted to the idea of, I remember the bullet points we had, no pens, no homework, no memorising. It seemed almost too good to be true. I mean, those are three of the kind of, um, I guess, the unique elements of the of his method, isn't it? Mm. The, the no, no writing. No. No reading, I guess, as no. well. No, no homework and no, no memorising. No, me- he absolutely forbade m- memorising. His whole premise was that if you try to learn, you become tense, you become stressed, and stress is the greatest barrier to learning. Let, let's let's dig a little bit deeper into the methodology because it's um people listening to this are language learners mm-hmm. and they you know this this interest in language. I mean the methodology is is striking, isn't it? I mean it's mm. I mean for me personally, I can't imagine learning without writing, reading and writing. I, I simply can't, and I. It's a common question that, that, I, that I find is, does the methodology actually work? Going into it, did you have any strong feelings about the methodology either way? Did you, were there discussions about the adaptations? Were there, did you have, did you have these, this, these discussions? About, are we really not going to have any reading and writing? No, not really, because we knew we had to accept. We had to accept what he was offering. There was no room for negotiation, so we had to go with it. And I know it worked because I remember the first, after the first day of recording, we we recorded the first ones over two days. It was just straight one day and the next day, eight hours, eight hours, or maybe six hours, six hours. He just went through. And I remember at the end of the eight, the first day, I thought, oh, those students, they've learned so much. It's going to be awful tomorrow. They'll come back to the studio and they won't be able to remember anything. Next day in the studio, it was still all there. They remembered everything from the, from the day before. He would give yeah. them a, a five minute to a three minute um, quick revision. It couldn't be revision, but just to reestablish their confidence, really. And the basis of this, from, from, from as I understand, is, is essentially understanding. So he, yes. he says it's important that you understand. He used to say, what you understand, you know. And what you know, you don't forget. So this was why it was very important for all the students in the studio to think. As much time as you wanted for thinking. Because if you were thinking it through, it was going into your long term memory yes so i think the promise on the um, sleeve of the recordings might have been almost that you could learn it in your sleep or there was no effort involved yeah i mean it does play very nicely into uh, people's what people would like language learning to Mm. be doesn't it (laughs) we would all like it to be yeah to the physically no homework and no memorizing uh, in in, in our sleep so it's easy to see i mean from a from a from a marketing perspective as well just how how well, that works with yes. the mass market. Which, mm-hmm. I mean, do you think that has had any any role in the popularity? Not, not recently. I think it did in the immediate popularity, but I think now it's established, and so it's almost self perpetuating. So the recordings themselves. What was it like to to watch him in action doing the? The recording. It was amazing, absolutely amazing. And I think this is my biggest regret that we didn't film the um, teaching because it was wonderful just to see. Although not much was happening in so much as it was very quiet and very calm, there was a great atmosphere, a great intensity, a great energy because the students were concentrating. Michelle was concentrating he he made it look so easy he was teasing out the the language really from the students but he had no notes he went into the recording studios with no notes he apparently taught each course differently every time because he always managed to tailor it to suit the students he was teaching so he's reacting and responding to mm, the, and the at students. times he would go off at tangents and we would think I'd sit next door to my colleague, man, well, what's he doing now? You know, where's he going with this? But then 10 minutes later, he would have brought it back to exactly where he wanted to be. 
It's quite something, isn't it, going into a, to do a recording like this with no notes? No notes. I mean, do you think you're prepared? No. No? No. I think you prepared for the Italian because Italian was his, what, the weakest of the four languages, I think. Not the weakest, but I think he prepared you mean for his that. Own, his, in his own yes, language? Yes, yes, yeah. yes. But even then he had one or two little scraps of paper that he would surreptitiously look at. He didn't have a script or a, a master plan. Well, he did have a master plan, but it was in his head. Yeah, and, and I suppose that, you know, being so proficient at French and Spanish and so on, Italian to a certain degree has a, yeah. has a lot... A yeah, lot the, 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 I guess the methodology, whatever it was, yes. um, would have been much the same. Similar, yeah. I'm trying to, to visualise <laughs> the, the recording itself. And I, I'm, I, I remember him saying something along the lines of um uh, you know the importance of being relaxed and having a very you know comfortable environment much like we're in yes. now you know a little table with some nice flowers and, and so on and so forth but was did the recording equipment and the people the sound engineers and all that not interfere with the the process at all not at all because they were wearing lapel mics and i think that was one of the, the rare occasions um, they were used at the recording studios because we were used to language um, recordings being very formal with a script and each um, actor having their own mic. This was very informal. And as I say, they just went on and we just let the recording play. In fact, Michel, even though he was, I say, late 80s, he never wanted to stop. In fact, we told the students that we gave them a signal to give us they had to put their hands behind their head and lean back as if they were getting a bit tired. And then we would say, oh, sorry, Michelle, we've got to stop. We've got to um, change the tape or something, which was completely um, unnecessary. Yeah. But it was we had to give him a reason to stop. Otherwise, he would just have gone on. The, the course itself, the first course, was recorded over two days. Is yes. that right? Mm-hmm. Did all you... Of um, all of them recorded over two days? Yeah. Did you... Uh, Afterwards, did you sit and discuss and talk about it, or was it? I can remember. The, I can no. I can remember the first break. Um, we recorded the French one first. Our recording manager came into the, the booth where we were sitting, the kind of control box, and he said, "Well, he was just amazed. He'd sat through so many language recordings, and he was just blown away by it." He said, "I can't believe this. Even I think even I could learn a language." <laughs> <laughs> so there was an immediate excitement um i think we felt that we were at the start of something really important something really new how happy was michelle with the the recordings themselves and the, and the courses he was always happy he was always confident his courses were the best you know he never thought they, were, they could ever be improved well they were improved because he'd spent 26 years refining them um no he, he was happy were there any doubts at all? I mean, he, he, you, you get the impression from, from watching him and listening to what he says that he has absolute confidence in the, the truth, if you like, of what, of what he's doing. Do you, do you think he had any, any doubts or was, was there anything revealed in your conversations with him that, 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 um, that no. you think actually maybe he's not quite so sure no, about this? No, he had no doubts and he inspired confidence in those around him. Uh, one of his... Um, claims is that one of the things he said learning is your learning is my responsibility if you don't understand something it's my problem I haven't taught you properly so the students were relaxed and he was relaxed and it was like being with somebody who gave you a feeling of security and safety somebody who absolutely knew what they were doing did you um ever speak about the because one of the the implications of this or what we're talking about is that the teacher is very very involved in the process Mm -hmm. I wonder myself how to what extent that is then scalable as a methodology because um, you know if with 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 so much involvement from the teacher and such long stretches as well Mm. of I I don't know if all of his teaching was done in such intense conditions but um, did it, I, I don't know if you ever had any discussions about how such a methodology could be scared. I mean, if you were to roll this out across schools and universities around the 
around the you know around we, the world and yeah. how would it work we did in fact have discussions and we did in fact develop s- some schools courses really um yes and they were very very effective and were they implemented yes um there's one of one or two schools still using them and we are working on re-releasing them but that was very impressive um that was quite a good story really uh a guy phoned, we were getting phone calls all the time from people saying, oh, this is wonderful, etc., etc." And um, I had a phone call one day and um, this guy said, I, I'm a teacher, I've been using Michelle Thomas, uh, I've been using it in my classroom, which of course really wasn't quite legal because he should have <laughs> asked us first. Yeah. But uh, he said, can I show you what I've developed? And he came, met us, and he developed a course a Michelle Thomas based course that he could use in his 40 minute classes with his um, students as a a language teacher. I see and so that was then you then took that and did you develop it or? Yes, yes, yeah we had courses, we've got um, Michelle Thomas for schools courses but as I said they are in the process of being redeveloped at the moment but that was nice. very exciting to see whole classes being taught the Michelle Thomas method. Yeah, well, I mean, it still is a very exciting process. Maybe that's a, maybe that's a watch this, watch this space. I've watch this uh, space, yes, it thing, is indeed. Yeah. We, um, we were chatting briefly earlier about how Michel Thomas actually learnt his languages. And, mm. and, well, no one seems to be quite sure. No, yeah. and um, I never really had that conversation with him, which is rather strange. Yeah. I know I read that he claimed to speak ten languages, and I can account for seven. I was counting up English of course now, Polish, he was born Polish, German, he lived in Germany, French, he lived in France, yes, Spanish, I don't know where he got Spanish from, and yet he was very, very fluent in Spanish. He taught Hispanic classes to teach English in the in the 60s, so that's Spanish, Yiddish probably, because he was um, Jewish. These are all languages you heard him speak? Italian, yeah, yeah. but then there's three more, I don't know sure. about those. It's funny, isn't it, because with... Um... One of the questions that polyglots are always asked is, well, how did you learn your languages? Mm. You, know, you would think it was the kind of question that uh, that he'd be asked a lot. I'm not, did he give many, many media interviews? No, he he didn't. But there again, he was very available and amenable. If there was... Um, he went on breakfast TV one morning, oh, I remember. Right. But he, that meant getting him getting it up at five o'clock in the morning. And he was already in his late ages, but he was game for it. So he liked that kind of, he did like that kind of media attention. In many ways, it, it, it's a, it follows that from that someone who, who has learned so many languages would then go on to teach them. But of course, I mean, I, one of the things I've become very aware of is that there's many, many people out there in the world who do speak many languages, mm. but then but see it as more of a kind of lifestyle and don't actually work in it professionally. Mm. I mean, I've, have you... Any inkling of what inspired him to actually dedicate his life to teaching languages? As you say, he's a man of many talents. Yes. And it, yeah. it only takes a kind of um, brief reading of all the all his wartime activities to to to, to understand mm. just how capable and talented he was. Do you know what it was about languages that got him so fired up? <laughs> um, I remember him telling telling me that he was very inspired. He studied psychology at the Sorbonne when he was in his 20s, late 20s, I think. And one of his lecturers said, no one really understand how the brain works. And that, that stuck with him. And then I think his wartime experiences when he withstood torture from the Gestapo, and he lived in slave labour camps, his um, experiences with the French resistance. He realised the power of the mind. He was able to blot out pain and... Um, of course, he lost his whole family in the Lost in his family, yeah, yeah. So I think he, he was intrigued by the power of the brain and he wanted to explore it. And he said that he chose languages because he thought languages lear- language learning was one of the most alien um, processes that the brain would undertake. So he started exploring how languages could be taught. That's very interesting. He said that language learning was one of the most alien processes. Yes, he did. Did that, did that 
do you remember how he reacted to that? Because no. that, that, it's, it's an odd phrase. Yes, it is. But those are the words he used, and I didn't react. Mind you, you would never interrupt him when he was talking. <laughs> <laughs> but um, and I thought that was rather strange. I should have taken him up, him up on that. But that, I think he he developed his method, and he found it was very successful. And then I think celebrities started coming and he start, started becoming famous. And I think he, he did enjoy the lifestyle it gave him yeah. and the celebrity status he himself acquired. Well, it's, he's got quite a, quite a list of, um, of celebrities on his, mm. on his resume. <laughs> it's amazing. He lived in yeah. LA, of course. Yes, yes. Yeah. Um, I guess well, there's only one last thing I'd like to ask you, really, which is if there's anything that you never asked him that you wish you had. Or if you had a if you could um, wind the clock back, is there anything <laughs> are there anything that you would have liked to ask him or, or any maybe any part of, of 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 him or his story that maybe you felt unsatisfied with or I suppose I might have asked him you you couldn't ask him personal questions really. He didn't do small talk. Um he was happy to talk about the celebrities he taught. Um, he'd tell you anecdotes about what had happened. I think probably with Michelle, you were more of a listener. It's just the way it was. It's the way it was. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and I think that's what we all found. And actually, you had to be very careful because if you upset him, he was very unforgiving. You know, once someone like, upset him or offended him, that was it. Doors closed. Doors closed, yes. So you had to yeah. pro- progress very slowly. Well, I think it's a, it's a very fitting uh, <laughs> fitting um, way to, to describe him, really, someone who you listen to, because obviously there's so many thousands, I suppose millions of people around the world who enjoy and who learn from, from listening to him. Yeah. And it's one of the, one of the, one of the great stories of, of, uh, of language learning and language material, what, what he's produced. So I guess we're all very fortunate mm. that... You did actually do all this work, and we now have the, all these tapes and these materials here. So I'm sure um, I would. I'm sure many people listening would like to, you know, mm-hmm. thank you for actually doing that and doing that sort of, that service to the um, to the language community. Well, it was a great privilege to have been part of it. Wonderful. Well, that's it's great to hear that there's a lot more on the way, and it's a, it's mm-hmm. a the book is still being written, as it were. So thank you so much for taking the time to talk to us, and yes. um, it's a wonderful. Uh, Wonderful story to have been told. Oh, it's, been, it's been my pleasure. Thank okay. you. Okay, I hope you enjoyed that conversation with Sue Hart. It was a, an absolute pleasure to meet her and to have this conversation. I really feel like it was a, a, a privilege having a window into into all the events that, uh, <laughs> that led up to the creation of these courses. So I'm, I'm very, very happy. If you'd like to continue the conversation uh, about what you've heard here today and about Michelle Thomas in general, then there's a number of ways you can do that. First of all, you can navigate to the blog post that accompanies this recording where I've summarized everything, uh, really the, the best bits from the whole interview, along with the, some some quotes that I, um, I I took from what Sue was talking about. And you can find that by going to IWillTeachYouAlanguage.com forward slash Michelle. M I C H E L. So I will teach you a language.com forward slash Michelle. There you're going to find lots of extracts and notes. Like I mentioned, you're also going to find a photo of myself and Sue at the, uh, at the teach yourself offices in London. You can also leave a question there. If there's anything you'd like to know or ask, I'll, I'll see if I can persuade Sue to come back and perhaps, uh, answer a couple of questions there or maybe I can do that on her behalf but anyway if you'd like to, to leave a comment or ex, uh, ex, express your uh, your appreciation to Sue or ask a question or otherwise then you can do that at the same link similarly if you have any friends who you know have used Michelle Thomas courses before or anyone who's learning a language in general and you think they would uh, benefit from or enjoy this interview, then please do feel free to share that with them either on social media or by sending a link in an email, anything like that. Again, you can find the link to this and everything I've mentioned at IWillTeachYourLanguage.com forward slash Michelle. Thank you so much for listening and see you next time. 
Thank you so much for listening to today's episode. I really hope you enjoyed it. You know, one of the questions I get asked most often about language learning is how to improve your memory. Because things get so much easier when you learn new words and you don't forget them later in conversation when you really need them. So what I decided to do was to put together a, a, a short email course. It's a three-part email course over three days that teaches you my favorite techniques for memorizing vocabulary and actually putting that vocabulary into your long-term memory. It's a short course, three days, it's completely free. And if you'd like to sign up for it, please go to IWillTeachYourLanguage.com forward slash free memory course. 